Welcome to African Drums. I'm your host, Elsie Harry, and I'm glad that you've joined me this evening. History has taught us that Guyana is a plural society, consisting of six different ethnic groups, possessing their own culture and their own ideas on how Guyana's development should look. The conditions which have led to the presence of so many competing interests within this single geographical space have been nothing short of damaging. The transatlantic crossing and the brutal system of enslavement is etched into the ancestral memory of the African Guyanese community. Other ethnic groups have their own stories to tell, inclusive of indentureship and crossing the Bering Straits. We can agree that the thing that affects us all is the fact that the old con colonial system still pervades Guyanese society and is manifested in the institutionalized racism that is observed daily. Ethnic cleavages continue to exist. Nevertheless, Guyana's potential to see beyond the ethnic divide is expressed in the intermixing of people of various ethnic groups to create an entirely new ethnic construct, people of mixed race or ethnicity. What does Guyana's historical baggage and changing ethnic construct mean for the development of Guyanese society? How exactly do we move Guyana forward and what is the role that each of us need to play? This and other matters will be discussed on this e edition of African Drubs, dubbed A Conversation on Race, Historical and Current Perspectives. My guests this evening are Mr. Freddie Kisun, academic and commentator, Ms. Charlene Wilkinson, lecturer in the Department of Languages and Cultural Studies at the University of Guyana, and founding member of the newly established Guyanese Languages Unit within that department, and Mr. Vincent Alexander, Chairman of the International Decade for People of African Descent Assembly, Guyana. Sister, brothers, welcome to African Drums. Thank you Thank very you much. Elsie. Okay, so the first thing that I want us to begin with is a discussion of the history of race or ethnic relations in Guyana what ethnic groups have existed in early Guyanese society, and what role did each of these ethnic groups play in relation to each other? And see, if I may start, uh, I'll start by, first of all, challenging something you said in your introduction. Sure. I don't agree that one should speak to the question of institutional racism as a phenomenon that pervades Guyana. 
I do agree that there are instances and elements of racism, but I, if at all we should speak about institutional racialism as opposed to racism. Because I see racism as one group perceiving itself to be superior to the other and therefore having a right of domination. In our instance, I think what happens is groups show preference mm -hmm. for their like. And in that regard, I, I would say it's racialism as opposed to uh, racism. Some people might say I'm being semantic, but I, I like to make that differentiation. Uh, in terms of Guyana, we clearly have the history of the comment of the Guyanese people, starting with the comment of the Amerindians. And there are those who may argue that even before the Amerindians came, there was an African presence. But I don't think that is what impacts us today, and therefore it's not a matter we should really uh, make a bone of contention. So we talk about the coming of the Amerindians in the first instance, and in that regard, they are referred to them as the indigenous people. Uh, thereafter, I think the Europeans were the ones who would have come, and they would have come in search for territory, in the process of colonization, in the process of expansionism, and their comment obviously brought them into contact with those who were here before. And so they would have come into contact with the Armenians. And given their own venture, the relationship from the very inception would have been an antagonistic relationship where they sought either to take control of what essentially belonged to the Armenians, the land, or to take the Armenians into some kind of servitude to serve the purpose for which they had come. That is to seek wealth and to make wealth. Uh, that enterprise was not altogether successful, and so they had to turn to other sources. And here we have the coming of the African Guyanese through the process of enslavement. And again, it's an antagonistic relationship that emerged because they brought them for the purpose of exploitation. But the antagonism became tripartite, if I may say so, or threefold, because having come, they set off the Amerindians against the African Guyanese. And so here we had the beginning of an antagonistic relationship, a conflictual relationship between the Amerindians and the African Guyanese, based on the rule that the Europeans sought to have the uh, Amerindians play. Not all of them, but some of them, in relation to the African Guyanese, virtually policing the hinterland to ensure that African Guyanese could not uh, escape uh, enslavement. And that policing in some time, some, some cases took some very brutal forms that people don't like to mention. Uh, with the abolition of slavery, then the relationship was not intended to change really, just the form of oppression and exploitation that the British, the, the, the colonizers sought to change. But the freed enslaved sought to change the relationship itself in two ways. One, they sought to establish villages and in a sense started the process of liberation. And on the other hand, where they continued to work, uh, they sought to get into contractual arrangements which gave them the scope to demand uh, uh, better wages uh, for the work which they were doing. That led to the British recognizing that they could not perpetuate the exploitation they wanted to because here was a group of people who if they were the only ones from whom they could get the pool of labor, they'd be able to make good demands. And so they went further afield, seeking for labor again, and the so doing they brought the, the, the Chinese, that didn't quite work either. They brought the Portuguese, that didn't quite work either. And then they brought the, uh, the Indians. And that seemed to have worked in terms of replacing the African Guyanese on the plantation. Now in all of, all of what they did, uh, they perpetuated an antagonistic relationship between the groups that came. And so when the Indians came, they gave them privileges, uh, that they hadn't given to the Africans, but they also embedded in them the, the view that these Africans were barbaric and not people to be, to be dealt with. 
Um, in terms of the Chinese, eventually they were given privileges in terms of involvement in trade. The Portuguese were also given privileges. So that there was this continuous act of differentiating between the groups, among the groups, and setting them off one against the other. Okay, thank you. And in that sense, I would like to um, perhaps tweak your comment a little that we don't have institutionalized racism because I think those teachings, that propaganda that the British set up is still very much etched in the consciousness of the, the people who came after the Africans, who came um, and learn to live with the system that the British, in order to, to survive within it, they had to adopt some of the, the racism. And to this day, those things still exist in Guyana. It's, it's even deeper than institutional. It's deep in the psyche of people who are not African in Guyana. You know. But I would recognize the, the, the psyche aspect. Mm -hmm. When I said we don't have institutional, I was kind of referring to the, the, the machinery of the state and the state institutions, those, those institutions that are established for the purpose of conducting relations. But certainly I agree with you. I, I would still, I wouldn't want people. to go deeper into it, but I hope at some point we get into the fact that the state itself is still serving many of the interests of white supremacy. And I know I'm going to mash a lot of corns, but if we don't touch those things, we are not going to be talking anything serious. And another thing I would like to, to talk about is the fact that we don't know enough about when the Africans came before Columbus and what kind of relationships they formed with those indigenous peoples. To me, I think that hidden knowledge is also part of white supremacy. It is a deliberate attempt to hide and people, our researchers, are still trying to delve into what really happened, what kind of relationships were built. I mean, we have those big Olmec sculptures that clearly are black people that were here, planted on this part of the world before Columbus ever knew that this part of the world existed. So these are things we have to remember. I keep stressing that white supremacy as Elsie would know, is still alive and well, and is etched in us in so many different ways. The very ethnic divide that you wish to speak about tonight has to do with that. White racism equal to white supremacy is synonymous with, ra with racism, and unless we see, if we're not serious tonight, we will, not, we will leave out the fact that the whole institution uh, um, of capitalism has come out of that corporate, no corporate capitalism. Freddie, would you like to get in on the <laughs> discussion? Well, well, well <laughs> I see my contribution here given time constraints. <laughs> as, as, <laughs> more, as more, as um, more looking at the waste problematic in three areas exacerbation of it, the factors, um, leadership role in that exacerbation, and uh, some thoughts about uh, solutions. Because 50 years ago, I, I imagine scholars were talking about what Vincent has just enunciated. So I, I want to get into that aspect rather than the historical aspect. So when it comes to those parts of the discussion, what has been different in the racial uh, antagonism, the racial divide from the 50s and 70s to now the 21st century? Uh, is it a more dangerous racialism? Um, I prefer Vincent word racialism rather than racism in the Guyanese context. Is it more internecine? Is it, is it less obnoxious? Those are the areas I would like to get into. I will leave the historical adumbration for Charlene. Oh, I'm not a historian, by the way. Uh, uh, let, the, let the audience know that. Okay. So that we can get more into the meat of the discussion, let me ask you a few more questions with regard to the history. Were there any factors, two things, were there any factors that united 
the ethnic groups historically in Guyana, as well as what are the origins? Well, we spoke about the origins of the conflict, but were there any factors that united the ethnic groups? I think that, um, yes, there is a factor uh, that can unite and has from time to time united the ethnic groups. And that factor is the fact that there was a really a single oppressor and a single exploiter. Mm -hmm. And from time to time, the groups were able to recognize the commonality of interests. Mm -hmm. And in that regard, they were able to come together. Um, let me say this, Elsie, that you, you made, you referred also in your introduction to the plurality of our society. And I think we should accept that as a fact. And accept that the plurality of our society had to do with the coming of different peoples. And that that was not something manufactured because the different peoples uh, had different belief systems, different cultures, different languages, and therefore the plurality is almost natural. The problem we face with is the exploitation of that, uh, yes. that plurality. Mm -hmm. Okay, you, do you have something to add, Charlene? Not at the moment. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I will interrupt if something pops up. Okay, so let's talk about what has exacerbated this plurality over the years, the, the conflict stemming from this plurality? Well, what exacerbated the plurality is the very reason for the plurality itself. The fact that uh, you had what we may consider as a homogeneous society, may consider, because even among the Armenians you have different uh, ethnic groups, exactly. right? Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have a lot of history that talks about a lot of conflict uh, among them, and I'm not here to be wrong. I might be wrong in that uh -huh, regard. Uh -huh. But certainly, once the British came, once the, the Europeans came, and with, with an intent to exploit the land and the people, that became the source of, of conflict. Mm -hmm. And um, that itself created the plurality and became the source, the source of conflict. And what we had really were wrongs of comments that did that over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And um, it was obviously manipulated by the Europeans in their interests. I mean, even the word ethnic. Honest, let me be honest with you. I didn't learn that word until I was like in my 40s. And I am not ashamed of it. The word ethnic, if you look at the way the word is used, I have, it may not be true that it doesn't happen, but I have never heard white people describe themselves as ethnic is we, the other non-whites, the other. They, what they have done, what white supremacy has done is othered all the rest of us, turned us into objects of their desires, whether it's for our labor, our land, our water, no, our oil. And let's, you know, we're talking serious or you're joking around. Um, so this word ethnic kind of obfuscates mystifies the fact that we are not ethnic groups we are peoples each nation each indigenous group here could be called a people a nation in their own right mm -hmm. so we could be said to have many nations within this larger construct that we're not calling Guyana and we got to be careful when we we'll calling and who calling us Guyana Okay, let's talk about... Just let me make sure. a, a slight point here. Uh, there was much... There was much of what Charlie was mm -hmm. nations. The difficulty with the definition of the Guyana context is that nations normally also have a geographical context. And outside of the mm -hmm. Amerindians, yes. um, coming of the people. I felt it coming. Uh, there was no mm -hmm. geographical context to that. Yes, yes. They were all thrown into one melting pot, so to speak. Yeah, but to forget that and, we came and, from nations. And, we came and, from nations. Yeah, we came from yeah. nations. And, and, and you see, it's going to get complex. But it's, it's going to start to explain a part of the African Guyanese problem. Absolutely. Because the African Guyanese did not come from one tribe or from one nation. They also came from nations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So it's complex and it's beautifully complex. And why would you want something simple and sanitized? Let, let me give an example of a demonstration of this reality. Um, our history tells us of the conflict between the two different tribes that occupied Mocha and Archie. Mm -hmm. There were different tribes and there was conflict. Partly engendered by the different regime of slavery that existed in Mocha as opposed to Arcadia. But there were clearly different tribes and different nations, so to speak, and were at conflict, even as there was conflict between them and the Europeans. But the world has always had that. Yeah. You can talk true. about, the, the, uh, in a sense, the many nations of Africa but yet there was kind of it's what you might call federation of nations i mean maybe they didn't use that term but you certainly had the federation of nations among the the native people of north america the, or the, the indigenous people of, you know it is something this particular kind of violence that freddie is holding back to talk about it is something to do with the nature of the european and I'm not saying we must hate white people. My daughter has white blood in her. I got white blood in me. I'm sure if you look I hard mean, enough, you will find in both of them. But <laughs> there's something with the nature of the European. And if, <laughs> we, don't, for myself, if we don't start being serious about understanding ourselves and the oppressor, you know, we will be sanitizing the thing. So having a pretty discussion and not moving forward to really delve into it. Well, this is a good discussion to have because even as we hear discussions on race and history in Guyana, these are some of the things that are not usually discussed. So I think it's definitely a good discussion to have. And I want to add another dimension to the discussion, politics. Politics leading up to independence in Guyana as well as politics after independence in Guyana. How did that unfold? But that, I know this is your area. But, but that, that <laughs> I, I wanted to um, I wanted to move away from the complexities <laughs> and sophistication of the historical origins, though I do not deny the exigent validities of those presentations. But at the end of the night, I want some of the young people to look at the program and say, "This is 20th century Guyana." How do I 21st century, 21st century yeah. Guyana? How do I get around this racial thing that uh, my parents were born into? And by exacerbation, I meant in that context that you have just mentioned. Um, I don't think Guyana is any different in its um, racial divide from from ma many other countries. I mean, it's going on in Ireland, although it takes no religious thing. It's in Belgium, but they seem to have uh, dealt with it more successfully than we have. So the question to my mind is, if we're going to deal with it successfully, as Belgium is attempting to in other places, is we have to look at what has exacerbated racial consciousness, racial animosity, racial suspicion, um, my new racial, not racist. Um, thanks for the contribution in that respect, Vincent. Um, what has exacerbated it? How do we analyze the exacerbators? And what do we do in the 21st century? The unfortunate thing about Guyana's racial divide is leadership. Now, I, I, I'm going to get a bit complex here and um, talk about leadership just briefly. I think leadership is one of the strongest dialectic in human civilization and uh, it has moved human civilization and I think it's responsible for broad social movements and their setbacks and their successes from time immemorial. And the problem we have with the racial divide is I think our leader our leadership exacerbates it and that is because the given the evolution of our country after um, in, in, in um, 
the um, self-government era, then the immediate pre-independence era and post-independence era is that we, we evolved in a way in which those, the, 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 the negativities of the pluralities from the colonial times were taken over after um, in the um, self-government era and the post-independence era. And different types of forces, different types of, 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 of menus were put into it. One of which is how political parties evolve. And I think that is the nagging exacerbator that has to be discussed if we're going to talk about solutions. Our political parties evolve along, well, I don't know if what Charlene is going to do with the word that I'm going to say now, along ethnic lines. What if Charlene doesn't like the word? I would say along racial it's, lines. It's, it's a perfect uh, word uh, because along, it's not our word. Right. Along, um, That's why I didn't walk in. Right. <laughs> I have to ask the audience to be laughing. with me. Charlie makes me laugh in any discussion I'm going to tell. So, I, uh, uh, what I, I'm sure Vincent is going to have a, 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 a plethora of ideas on this. Our, uh, um, our politics, our sociology, no, sorry, not our sociology, our politics evolved along a type of party line that exacerbates this thing. So what we have, and, and this is where the racialism as a concept comes in as opposed to racism. I don't think there's been any, any even the remotest manifestation of racism in our politics. I, I don't think our political leaders from self-government give a damn who is Indian or who's African mm -hmm. and who's superior. Mm -hmm. right. mm -hmm. their, their thing, was to capture state power mm -hmm. and appeal and appeal to constituencies. Mm -hmm. That hasn't changed since then. Yeah. Now what 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 is so important is that the people, the people themselves accept this direction of leadership. Once we have a change in that type of leadership, I think it all goes well for the diminution and gradual erosion of racial consciousness and racial um, imaginations. Let's let me give you one example before uh, uh, I let other people come in because I don't want to be like Vincent and take up a lot of time. Let me show you how, important, done so. let me show you how important leadership is. You have, you have people at the border with the US, US immigration outposts, with Canada, with Mexico, and those people know that their leader, their president is saying, um, meticulously survey non-white people coming across the border, etc. That's what they feel their leadership want. You will have 180 degrees difference if there is a, 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 a Bernie Sanders or a, a Barack Obama protege that is now the president. And he says, Muslims are welcome, non-white people are welcome. Those immigration officials will behave differently. So it comes back to the seminal role of leadership in human civilization. And we have a leadership in Guyana, whether deliberately, whether given the vortex of the politics they're involved in, they exacerbate this racial divide. There have been two exceptions and they were short-lived. I think the Working People's Alliance and the, uh, um, was it the, uh, the, the what? The a I'm, I'm getting old. AFC? The AC, what? The, the president of AFC? AFC. AFC. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, until we're able to change our winner-take-out politics, until we're able to diminish that leadership hold on racial constituencies. We're going to be here for the next 50 years discussing solutions. Um, sorry for that long um, I, elongation. I, I, I don't quite agree with Freddie's one-dimensional approach to this question. Um, I agree that leadership has played a role, but I don't agree that it's only political leadership which has played a role. We have institutions which not in a direct way, but by virtue of their 
additional leadership have played a role. And I think the most significant institution in that regard is the religious institutions. If you look at how some Christian bodies view Hinduism, and if you look at how some other bodies view the African mythical order, Inherent, inherent in that is also the basis for this divide and disregard. No, I, I, and for, I, I, I don't and, want to interrupt you. And for racism. I concede that, but that's peripheral. For that's peripheral to the exacerbation. And I will I, concede I, that. It is deep in the mind that's and the true. psyche of the people. And yes, therefore, yes. it is a factor that plays in because you would see even in our political organizations we've had coming up the Muslims at some times the Christians at other times the Hindus at other times they, they've not been separate so that it's, it's, it's more complex than just a single question of politics that is true but I can't I don't think you could deny Freddie's point about the fact that it is the pol political economy that gives us our structure if we're gonna call ourselves a nation then the, and I still don't really know if we should be calling ourselves a nation the way I feel about how things are unfolding right now. But this, there is a there is that's the language we're using, and the political economy has made us we, into gonna, a nation. We're not going to get past a nation state that easily. No, we're not getting. That is the point that Fred is making, because it is the political economy that gives us this nation state structure. And every year, or every four years, we are lined up like cows to the, in the pen to go to the polls to, re to decide what will be the shape of that structure. We see over there's a difference between again. the cause and the catalyst. And I'm saying that the plurality, which was natural, is, is the basis upon which everything else has become possible. Without that plurality, which was natural, the politicians would not be able to have the construct that you're talking about. And so we must recognize that even as we seek to solve the problem, we may seek to eliminate the rule of the politicians, but it will always be that unless we emerge into a nation's incarnation, there will always be that underlying, underlying plurality. And I want to get another point. Again, in this agreement with Freddie. Um, there are some politicians who have come to the table from a racist perspective. They have not, they're not the ones who have been dominant, but they've come to the table from a racist perspective. And you're making a distinction between racialist perspective yes, and racist. Yes, 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 from a racist perspective. Those politicians who've come to see, and there are such politicians, that our role is to preserve the originality of a group and not to allow the group to be subsumed into this acculturation which, uh, which weakens them, weakens the personality, come from a racial, racist perspective. Because what they're saying, look, some of these people here have been subsumed. They're no longer who they're supposed to be. We must continue to be who we're supposed to be. Because who we are is superior to what they have become. And that engenders racism. It's no, but I, I racism, but it's not in itself. No, racism. but I think you elevated. It is I think you elevated a lot of peripheral. These things exist. They they there at the subliminal level. But I think you magnifying it. Look, you can. I, th I, I think a good a good journalistic level. term for it is the lunatic fringe. The lunatic fringe exists in our society. I think they. I think they're East Indian people in this country, educated East Indian people who hang around political parties and say, this man, I think the Indians and the culture, you know, should take, uh, and I think the African people who knock around political parties say, we came here as slaves, we have a right, but those people have never emerged within the dominant leadership of any political party. And I don't think serious... I disagree with you in that regard. Because, you see, it's not of any political party. They've never, poss possibly have never emerged in the dominant leadership of the dominant political parties, but they have themselves formed political parties. And have been ephemeral. Okay, on the note of agreement, <laughs> let me ask a question here. 
have there been attempts throughout Guyana's development to promote understanding among the different groups of people in the country? Just as politicians have exacerbated the situation, have they also made attempts to promote understanding throughout Guyana's development? My answer would be yes. I think that they were the emergence of a nation has a lot to do with institutions. And I would argue... But they're umbilically tied. Mm -hmm. I would argue that in our history, there, there has been attempts to create institutions that could foster what you're talking about. Um, institutions might have been flawed, might not have succeeded, but they were attempts. And I would like to identify the National Service as probably the best attempt in that regard. Oh, I, I, I have to reject that. The best outright. failed attempt. I have to uh, I have to reject that. I outright. said they may not have succeeded. Uh, I have to I reject that. Uh, the best I have to reject that outright. And see, you know what I what I decided I will do when I came on this program and somehow I got a couple other things um, came into the way, and I, I have it. I have it in my file. When National Service came on the scene, and I wanted to photocopy it and show the, the audience. When National Service came to UG, I was then a student in the Faculty of Arts. There were 45 students from the Faculty of Arts that were consigned to do National Service. Okay? There were 45. Seven, only seven were African Chinese. Okay? Now, at that time, you, uh, at that time, it was an equal um, distribution of students at UG, maybe, maybe give and take a percentage. If you're going to say to me that the concept of national service, the theoretical concept, uh, uh, um, bring, breaking it into a, a philosophy that could work in a, a, a multiracial society, Fine, but if you what, can what tell me, if you me? can tell me what, the what is it you said attempted national service, which you means you identify you a specificity, you and that specificity is a national service in the seventies, because the national service in the seventies went badly wrong. I did say, Freddie, and you probably weren't listening. You're so caught up in what you wanted to say. <laughs> I said, I was caught up in the emotion of replying to you. It failed or not that institutions are critical, and the one institution where the idea of bringing the people together was was birthed, the idea was birthed, was national service. Well, I do interrupt both of you. I, 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 I think it's a good thing they are all failing because I don't think <laughs> I don't think people should try to bring people together. I think those things. The the thing that came to my mind when you asked the question was marriage, and I'm thinking right away of my own mother's marriage. My mother, Chinese woman, married a black man, but her mother didn't go to her wedding because my grandmother didn't want my mother to marry a black man. Fortunately, her father liked daddy. Her brothers and sisters didn't have a problem with daddy. But the fact that all of my mother's wedding pictures have my grandmother absent hurts me, let alone what it might have done to my mother. But guess what happened years, years later? Pickney Mac and everybody come and grow. Guess where my grandmother spent her last days? In my father's house, looking up in his eyes, holding his black hands and saying, Jack, so that institution of marriage that brought two races together, it wasn't easy, a lot of stuff, but a lot of interesting things came out of that. And my own experience as a person of mixed race. The bringing, the bringing together, Charlie, must be an opportunity, but it must have voluntarism in it. Well, that was the greatest the, the, kind of voluntarism the problem you could we have, about. The problem <laughs> we have is that people associate national service only with the university. He gone back to the national and service. And the university was a minor part in terms of quantum of national oh, service. Well, I certainly didn't associate with national service. And the university. larger part of national service was voluntary. I was one of so the you know, you are now, and you're now citing, national service. You're now citing the specificity of national service on the uh, end from 19, it came into the it came in And you're saying, you're saying that was a laudable attempt 
to bring the races together. You I can't see. find. Uh, so I, w- I would the opportunity. I would say. Well, you can't tell him. You wrong, can't right? tell him his opinion. It, 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 right? it, it, no, but you it, see, it I have, I have theoretical. No, sense. his opinion. I can't I tell him his opinion. Is my wrong. conclusion is not I could say I don't accept his opinion. <laughs> my conclusion is based on Guyanese of African and Indian descent saying to me that the only opportunity they had where they came to understand each other and to respect and appreciate each other he has the institution of national society. No, I've had the the opposite effect. The man has evidence. I have had 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 that involuntarily. I think I think there was a certain type of Indian mindset which needed to be exposed to Guyanese national eaters, etc. And uh, um, one could understand that an institution was created to expose the different ethnic groups to this kind of oneness that we should have had. But it was an imposition. And it was an imposition that achieved the opposite effect. L- let me ask, let me ask Vincent something. Okay. We have a serve national it's service. Okay. I can't remember you doing Guinness. national service. 80% of no, the Guinness. You ever did, did national service? I did national service. I did national service. I am more qualified to discuss national service. We will you, not you, discuss You were an officer in national service. Else. I was a f- <laughs> one of the Friends. first batches yeah. of cadet, teacher cadet officers. Okay, let's discuss something else because if we don't come off of national service this program no. will become about no friend it will become about uh, national service we need to come back to have one of course. Course. yes Absolutely. we can do that but this one tonight is not specifically about national service i think the so trade, trade unionism was a chance of bringing the <laughs> ethnic groups together yes, anyway yes, it's another yes, institution yes, yes, yes another another institution. Institution. i think that yes, was a yes, more very more much so trade freddie Okay. Very much so. There we go. Okay, so I want to ask you about some of the concerns of various ethnic groups within Guyana. Let's talk about some of some of those concerns. No, I, I think that there are concerns, and I think here is where the politics mm-hmm. fails us, mm-hmm. because our politics does not accept the plurality the way it should yeah. accept it, and therefore does not address the two levels at which we should address the country's problems. The specificity of the ethnic groups and the problems that they have, Mm -hmm. and the universal problem that we have as people in this place called Diana. So that the Amerindians have their problem in terms of how they've been regarded, um, what kinds of uh, services they've been afforded, what kinds of privileges, what kinds of recognition, respect, etc. There's the the problem of the Amerindians. The African Guyanese have, have, have had their problems in terms of the role they have that that that, that they have played in economic life and the, the attempt to suggest that where they evolved to was the displacement of others. I think the Indo Guyanese in a large way have a problem of, of, of physical security. And so this is not an example of every problem each group has. But I do agree that in the main the Amerindians, the Africans, and the Indians have problems that are specific to their groups, but these problems have not been addressed. And unless we address those problems, we're going to continue to be unable to come together uh, in a cohesive manner. And if my mother were alive, she would tell you you're always laughing out the Chinese people because they're so small in numbers. Why you did, don't you, even say, why did you say Chinese people? Chinese? You don't even call No, Chinese call, is who just come. You can't come. call them Chinese people. Wait a minute, Chinese is who just come. Chinese is Guyanese Chinese. Oh, well, well, you sorry, cannot no, use a term. It might sound funny. You cannot you. use a term that no. is loaded Chinese? with prejudice. Uh, Chinese that is, is a creole condescending word to people. For people from no, China who've been here Chinese, long. You better be and careful. And talking creole. You better be careful. Different you can, from the ones who you just can come. use certain terms okay, to describe. Okay, let's not focus on people. on some. As like you can call it some. I could translate it into English and say Chinese. Yes. But say Chinese. You can't call people Chinese. No, it's it's condescending. Shall you raise the a, can't you, you, then? you raise an important point, and I must confess that I normally focus on the three groups I mentioned. I accept the presence of the Chinese, I accept the presence of the Portuguese, but I also recognize that what the colonizers did in terms of a picking order 
was to give privileges to those groups that have not caused them to have the the, the magnitude of the problem with them is not the same as the three groups to which I refer. So I'm, I'm conscious of their presence. They are part of our plurality. But well, I, I don't think Charlie would deal. I think any elementary examination of our history would show that the Portuguese and Chinese were favored. Maybe it had to do with... Um, Maybe it had to do with complex skin complexion. Oh, definitely Maybe it had to favorite, do, but, but that doesn't mean you leave them out I, of I, the I, equation. Yeah. The other side to that is the... I don't know about all racialism is. I mean, I've talked about the grandmother thing. Yeah, <laughs> but I have an experience where I have a cousin. I can't call her name. It would be too shattering. Who drives me from one part of Brooklyn when I was in the States to the next helping me to move and says to me, you'll be better off here because there are not so many blacks to where you're moving there. So I am sorry, Len, we got to, if we can deal with this race thing, that's not like we racism. Can go, that's, that's racism. That's not what we have here. But she's Guyanese. Yeah. And she learned it in Guyana. Hello. So why you could have a no, Chinese but they, um, woman she spitting in the face she of a, a black man who stole from her store? She purified it over there. 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 day when a Chinese woman spit and mashed down a black child who she said was shoplifting. Y'all don't remember? You know the only I reason know. you forget that is because people then burned down no, this. Let me, let me go back. Let me start. Before before that. I said at the inception that I ex accept that we have instances of racism and situations of racism, but I didn't think our institutions were racist. No, you're correct. And therefore, our governance structure so is not based, on, and that's what I said. So, so I'm not saying you don't accept racism. But post, in the, post independence, right? Guyana, this seriously discouraged whatever extant racist mentality had existed. I think that's where Burnham and Jagan and the trade union movement. And um, Walter Rodney and those people came All in. That, you, did, you did, you uh, did. I always remember uh, Mark Curtin, my friend, uh, Dr. Mark Curtin, when his father was a his father was a journalist for the Chronicle, went to interview Percy Wright, who was the general manager for Fogarty's, and he went to his home, and Percy Wright said, "No, don't let him come through the front step. Let him come through the back step." Now, those are the racist things that the post-independent states seriously confronted. We don't have that thing here anymore. I don't we agree. At all. But if it, if it I exists... I think racism is alive and well in Guyana in the hearts and minds of people, and it is in a gradation. You go to the Chedi Jagon International Airport and see how they bring people off the plate. There's another phenomenon with Guyanese loving this street here, light skin people coming in from Venezuela and Cuba, but the Haitians got to come off the plate last. The Haitians come off last. We have a color coded, I said it before, I, I don't have that experience. I have the experience. We have <laughs> a color coded airport coming off the airport now, lying in Diana. I mean, it could be money. The Haitians are known to be poor in refugee status. The Cubans and Venezuelans come into shop. But look at the color, look at the color, look at the gradation of color there. You, you you gonna you, are you going to doubt? You have a problem with some black Cubans coming now? They're going to have a problem with black Cuba. Let me Inside Cuba, you have a problem with black not Cuba. It's racism again. inside not Cuba. Not of course, you're going to. If you all want serious Charlene, discussion, bring me on. You want if you want a little cocktail. You thing. want to see. Let me, ask, let me ask a question, Freddie. Even as we have different opinions, different understandings, different expressions coming from around this table with this small number of people, See? How do governments and policymakers, how does our government and our policymakers deal with concerns that you all expressed? I think one of the problems is that we have not been bold enough to recognize some of those things in their own right. We skirt around them and we've not confronted them. I think that's one of the problems. It I think, and I, I think it's, a, it's a major problem, comes back to even in terms of the present government. About. Yes. You're not bold enough to confront those issues. They don't want to. They don't have to. The white supremacists who they're serving 
will continue to fill their pockets until they grow old and maybe for another three four generations of their families the elite of this country of all colors is the problem here so you may you're simply talking about the class structure totally isn't it it um, is simple well i said you are it simply the now that the problem is simple we're not going to have any confrontation with any real thing unless we deal with the the issue of the elites of the countries. Well, I'm all over the Caribbean. I must, I must say, Charlene, and I, 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 please, I'm not being um, I'm not being light. I must say you have pinpointed something that I think tears away at my emotions because I'm a product of the seventies, one of the most radical period in, in Guyana. Yes. And I think this society has to be one of the most class riveted uh, uh, a country We've in the gone world. Backwards. I mean, this is we a, were not there this in is a society years. where people with wealth and status can get away with anything, can we, do anything. This country I has mean, gone man. backwards. It, it's right in the University of Guyana. No, no. Well, the well, university I, I itself is a mirror of the elite dysfunction. Well, what 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 of the country? Well, I, don't I, I know there's a man. I know there's a man at the <laughs> university that has a, a sartorial appendage that um, given your delivery here tonight. Yeah, leave you the man boat. Yeah. Leave the man bow tie. I was mentioning that anything. is the least of our problems. His bow tie. As a matter of fact, we want to feel it. He may be the least of our problems. You could now. Um, this is a live program. Is. Yes, it is. I believe. No, no. I. Uh, a point was made by Charlene, which I've been dwelling on recently in my own mind, that I do agree that the world problem, which has manifested itself uh, in ethnic form, race form, and all that form, at the base of that has always been the question of class. And, and that is why, for example, you have the problem in South Africa, where the mass of people uh, were, were given the impression that apartheid would, once you got rid of apartheid, be relieved of, of exploitation. Not recognizing that apartheid was the use of the, the white exploiter to mask exploitation from an ethnic perspective it was really an exploiter at the end of the day. And that in the black group, the African group, there were people who might have aspired to be similar. Mm -hmm. in terms of the economic disposition mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the white exploiter. Oh, yes. And that is the crux yes. of the problem that has confronted countries that claim they have gotten independence but it hasn't been delivered yes. onto them because they haven't understood. Sort of nice, eh? like a theory. But they it's they haven't understood. What has been delivered onto them mm -hmm. is liberation from a mass but the mass are still where they were. Yes, Professor Kimani Nihusi calls it they have become the managers for white supremacy. They're now managing the black masses in, in a most dangerous way because at least when we had, um, I don't know if you want me to continue on this program. When we had a different color in the parliament, it was clear. When we had a different color before the colonial, talk about black people now, it was clear. Now you have black faces in the parliament or the, in this, the government dominant, but what is the relationship of that power structure to the African masses and to how they will speak for the destruction of African civilization by white supremacy and what is their role in Guyana today to liberate their people? Like the shame to talk about race now. But what? the question here is that I, I'm not sure that they themselves are necessarily um, altogether conscious of their rule. So what we got them there for? Right. I'm not sure they're altogether conscious of their rule. Okay. We just have a well. few minutes left. Just like that, our hour is gone. So I think we'll have to agree to have another discussion where we can flesh out some more of the things that came out during this discussion. And then one on national service. And then one on national service, so that at the very least, we can confront the issues that others may not be willing to confront. One on, um, one on Charlene's thing about 
class driven Guyana and the my not domination. Thing, not my thing. No, no, that my could come, that come with discussing or um, Charlene thing of um, racism. That's she, she, she's dismissed the, the, the conceptual flow of racialism. She wants to discuss racism. No, the thing is, the, the other thing is who comes People on driven program. by superiority. Why don't we just stop ordinary people in the street? The boys from the music cart, the lady in the market, and bring them on the program, let them talk. You serious about this coalition government or what? One of the sad things I, I don't have, okay. one of the sad things going on right now, and I think it, it, it really, it really lacerates my psyche, is is the jailing of, of, of youths for a marijuana cigarette in a in an economic integration movement where across the board in Jamaica, mm -hmm. 46 gram is legal. And some from UG professors um, got it in their drawer at home. <laughs> you want this? You yeah, want well, this? Name and I go whistle. I don't know you. Okay, no calling names. <laughs> George this Jones. is this is the end of George the program because George. I am officially out of time. So I have to say thank you, Freddie. Thank you, Charlene. Thank you, Vincent, for being on African Drums. I'm sure that my viewers were very attentive during this discussion because there's a lot of information that you don't usually hear in discussions about Guyana's ethnic conflict or racial underpinnings so to speak so i'm happy to, to have had all of you on the program to give your understanding of what really is the problem in Guyana. thank you for having us i am honored thank you as usual vincent and i are recovering the signals <laughs> <in> this <program. laughs> okay viewers thank you so much Thank you so much for staying with me. This has been African Drums, the television organ of the Coffee 250 Committee, an organization dedicated to the empowerment of the African Guyanese community through education and to the encouragement of self-activity. Please like our Facebook page, it's Coffee 250. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, also Coffee 250, where you can see videos of the show. Check out our website, www.coffee250.com. Send us an email, coffee250gy at gmail.com, and please donate to the cause. I'm wearing this headpiece that was actually made by a UG student. Her brand is Chic Natural and Delicacy. She makes these headpieces as well as different delicacies that you can indulge in. She is called Miss Carrington, and her number is 617-3105. Please support a young entrepreneur and please stay tuned for African History Corner. I'm Elsie Harry. Please join me next time. Just think that this race of black men, today our slave and the object of our scorn, is the very race to which we owe our arts, sciences, and even our use of speech, says Count Constantine de Volney, the French philosopher, historian, and artist, as he stood before the Great Sphinx on the Giza Plateau in Egypt, Africa, in 1787. Hi, I'm Norm Nguyen, and this is Paragraphs of the African History Book. Count de Volney was surely aware of the golden age of the Moors from 711 to 1492 when he wrote these words. Recall, in 711 the Moors crossed the Strait of Gibraltar and entered the Iberian Peninsula, which they colonized and called it Anandulus, as shown on your screen. While there, they literally brought civilization to the peninsula, built cities, libraries, public baths, residences, civil infrastructure unknown at that time in the rest of Europe. The Iberian Peninsula was the showpiece of the West. More importantly, they brought education and literacy to the Iberian Peninsula and made it publicly available at a time when the kings of Europe could not read. Toledo became a city of translators who translated the Moorish texts into European languages and distributed the texts throughout Europe. And this is how Europe got access to the written word. This is how Oxford and Cambridge and other universities got their first textbooks from the Moors. And this is what jump-started the birth of Europe. Now, who are the Moors? The original Moors are black Africans, as shown on your screen, who originate in North and West Africa and Central Sahara, and who spoke Arabic. 
most practice a modified form of Muslim tradition. Their dynasties or their dynastic empires covered most of North and West Africa and Southwest Europe at various times. 711 to 1492 is considered to be the golden age of the Moors. Now the most revealing piece of evidence about the role and status of Moors in Europe are the many statues and portraits of knights in shining armor and of noble families found throughout Europe in private collections, churches, and public buildings. The figures show some examples of actual knights and also shows the extent to which Eurocentric scholars are currently going to try to distort history and the role of black people. Deep research identifies Ulrich von Hutten as the actual black German knight in shining armor. He was a contemporary of Martin Luther, the prominent figure in the Protestant Reformation and the teachings of the Lutheran Church. In Wikipedia, the picture of a fake white man is portrayed as the same Ulrich von Hutten. Also, in order to hide the actual identity of all the black knights, they're all called Morris the Moor. But now we know that this is definitely not the case and also are aware of the scope of media deception. Of course, by 1787, Camus de Volney was the beneficiary of the contributions of this people in at least two ways. One, from ancient Egyptian civilization, and two, from the Moors. The black dots indicate some of the countries throughout Central and Western Europe where Moors made their contributions and left evidence to show this. Why then, by just the end of that century, did the Negro myth surface. Now what is the Negro myth? It is a story that says the following. Black Africans have no history and have made no contribution to civilization. It was initially developed to justify slavery of black Africans and the African Holocaust. It was fortified and morally supported by Christian myth and allegory, such as the story of the children of Ham and other Eurocentric empires who even today continue their ongoing attempts at miseducating the world and deliberately and selectively falsifying African history. Folks, these stories and myths were known to be not factual since the time of Plato, the Greek philosopher, who recognized in no uncertain terms that, and we quote, we Greeks are in reality children compared to this people. This people being the black African Nile Valley civilization, which still amazes all, even today. Folks, recent scholarship by credible scholars of African history shows that the Negro myth is a 500-year-old lie meant to falsify history and justify physical and mental slavery of black African people. It recognizes that mental slavery is the worst form of slavery that gives you the illusion of freedom. So in the Eurocentric education system, we are fed a history buffet of lies to provide a false perspective of reality. But as Queen Mother Moore says, we must correct history that all that presents and presently denies our humanity and self-respect. We must, we must. It is no one's, it is in no one's self-interest to tell us our historical facts. Again, we must. It is in no one's self-interest to tell us our historical facts. We must recognize this. And since in this age of information, ignorance is a choice. That's correct. Ignorance is a choice. Your choice. Choose wildly and choose wisely. Not only for yourself, but for your children and grandchildren. Expand your knowledge with facts not myth and allegory. Strive to know your story. Strive to know your history is rich. Until next time, I'm Norling Queen.